we'd like you just to spend 30 seconds thinking about what water means to you or why water is important to you. Um, so you should in a moment have a poll question pop up. Um, so if you would be able to just have a think about that for 30 seconds and then pop down your responses in the poll in front of you, that would be fantastic. Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to pass on to thank you very much for your responses. Um, I'm just going to pass over to Harriet, who is going to give us um, an overview of um, West Country Rivers Trust and also the projects. Um, I'll leave that poll open as well. So if you want to add to it through the webinar, feel free to. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, through most of the speakers today, we probably won't have loads of time to have questions straight afterwards, so we'll probably have those right at the end. But you can always direct them directly to a specific person by adding their name. Um, so, yeah, West Country Rivers Trust was established in 1994. It's an environmental charity with a focus on restoring and protecting the freshwater environments of Cornwall, Devon and Somerset and Dorset. Um, its work is underpinned by science, evidence and experience and a commitment to the resilience of the region's rivers and streams, wetlands and estuaries to keep them healthy for wildlife and people, both now and in the future. Through educational activities and community engagement, it inspires a love for the region's rivers and its projects with businesses, other NGOs, environmental organisations, water companies and more work to keep bringing rivers to life. Uh, it is a member of the Rivers Trust, so that's a, the umbrella organisation for 65 member river trusts in the UK and Ireland, uh, which are a river and catchment conversation, conservation experts with a wealth of data and expertise at our fingertips. Um, so looking after our rivers is really essential um, and they are facing a number of different challenges. I'm sure you've seen the news and the articles about water quality um, and that like you might still be impacted by the hose pad, that hose pipe ban after a lot of the wet, dry weather we had last year. Um, so these various challenges will impact on like the benefits that you might have started talking about in that why is water important to you a second ago. Um, and yeah, so things like recreational activities, being able to drink something, um, being able to produce food, wildlife. Um, and so all these challenges could start reducing those benefits. So West Country Rivers Trust has many projects. Um, we tend to look at how we can mitigate those challenges or increase the benefits and generally just increasing awareness of the rivers. Um, so one of the challenges is an increased risk of flooding. Um, and that's something we'll be looking at a lot more today. Um, but it's also important to think that actually that's one of the benefits that a healthy freshwater system provides is kind of flood resilience. Um, so we've got a innovative new approach to kind of increase flood resilience through something called upstream thinking in rapid response catchments. The upstream thinking part of this, uh, it comes from trying to find what is the uh, location of the problem on the river and then looking above that on the whole catchment that kind of feeds into that point. Um, and one of West Country Rivers Trust's longest running projects has been using this approach since 2010, um, really on large scale catchments by looking at points on the river where water is extracted for drinking um, and then how the, everything within that catchment above it can be used to improve that water quality. Um, so that's been part of a Southwest Water Programme, um, to, as well as improving water quality, just wider river health. Um, but the upstream thinking rapid response approach is kind of looking at applying this at a much smaller area. Um, and typically in these kind of more rapid response cut style catchments, where during high rainfall events, surface flows and overland runoff overwhelm small communities. So these steep, small, fast responding catchments typify Devon's flood risk. Uh, the characteristics 
um, that define a rapid response catchment um, was kind of used in a national rapid response pathfinder program, which identified 384 very high or high risk uh, rapid response ca catchments in England. 20% of them were located in Devon and Cornwall. Um, and this long history of these flashy rapid responding catchments uh, is been, there's an example of lots of flood events which happened before. So there's the 1952 one in in, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, Linda, there we go. Um, so, and, across, and that was in North Devon and 34 people died. I'm sure you'll remember the Boss Castle flood in 2004, which is pictured here. And then a lot of the flooding which happened last at the start of this month, that's kind of a lot of those were in rapid responding catchments as well. Um, they tend to be in rural areas and the Flooding in them is starting to increase for things like degraded soils with reduced infiltration capacity, uh, simplified drainage patterns and more variable and extreme weather. Um, so the areas that we're looking at um, as part of the project we're talking about today tend to be a bit smaller than what was in the National Pathfinder one, because we're really interested in looking at whether this kind of upstream and community focused approach will work in a catchment that's under 10 kilometres squared where you might only have a few uh, properties at risk, but you've still got that kind of key community. Um, and really trying to see, just looking at the upstream area, um, when it's un under 10 kilometres squared, still work. Um, and everyone lies within the same parish. Um, so we're working alongside Devon County Council on the project is called Devon Resilience Innovation Project, or DRIP, um, to deliver the upstream thinking rapid response catchment. Um, it's funded by DEFRA as part of the £200 million Flood and Coastal Resilience Innovation Programme, which is managed by the Environmental Environment Agency. Um, it's to develop and test new approaches to help communities become more <laughs> resilient to the effects of flooding and climate change. Um, so we're looking at 10 of these small um, small catchments across Devon um, and there's eight communities because two of the catchment um, two of the communities have two catchments quite close to each other both feeding into the same community so that's in Ashburton and Beer. Um, many of the catchments selected um, would not typically be a high priority um, within local flood risk management strategy because it is only a small number of properties at risk um, and so putting in big expensive um, work like works is going to not necessarily have the same uh, cost uh, replicable low co um, <laughs> and cost benefit. That's it. <laughs> um, so we're really looking at whether you can do replicable low cost resilience actions um, and also if that can be delivered by the community, not just kind of an imposed on solution. Um, and what the different size and settings are. Um, so, yeah, so the four catchments that we're really going to be looking today are all in Dartmoor. Um, but we aren't the only project which is looking for resilience. There's lots of work going on. Um, one of the major projects is Dunmore Headwaters, and Tom will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, First one we've got mapped up here is Ashburton. So Ashburton is the community. We've got two micro catchments. Uh, the first is the Ashburn, st uh, starting on Rip on Rip and Tor, um, and then we've got the Ballon Stream to the east of that, and they both flow into the Dart. Then we've also got the Black Brook in Warcampton. So West Country Rivers Trust has done a little bit of work here before, and we'll talk to you a little bit about that today as well. Um, kind of starts off in the Commons, flows through Walkhampton and ends up in the Walk River Walkham. And then the final one that we're going to be looking at in the project is uh, the City Brook in Whitchurch. So it also covers Middlemoor and Grenfell. Uh, we just kind of call the community of Whitchurch to reference to it, but everybody there is included. Um, and that also joins the River Walkham once it gets into Tavistock. Um, so working with the community is going to be a really key part of this and we want them to help shape um, and develop the approaches that we're going to take in each of these um, in each of the catchments. 
Um, but then it's also important to think what actually is a community. Um, so one common definition is a group of people with diverse characteristics who are linked by social ties, share common perspectives and engage in joint action in geographical location or setting. So it's not just if you're a resident, although being a resident is definitely a key member of the community, um, but it could also just be farming the area. It could be being part of a local group such as a environmental group or a sports team. Um, could be being involved with the council, having a business there, or even just something like close friends and family ties. And these are some of the activities we're going to start doing as part of um, upstream thinking rapid response. Uh, it's kind of look at doing events and workshops, but then starting to develop some flood resilience interventions. We'll talk about some of the different options for that and start to test those approaches and looking at whether it is developing flood resilience and kind of monitoring that, but also all the other environmental benefits. So really want to make sure that you get everybody's getting all the benefits from those rivers. Um, West Crunch Rivers Trust has lots of um, trusted farm advisors as well, who can be going out and working with landowners and farmers to look at where the opportunities are for um, something for more of a natural flood management type, which is another thing we'll kind of discuss today. Um, so that takes us on to some other little polls, and it will probably be the last from me because I'm going to hand over to <laughs> <laughs> hand over to Helen and Rachel for a lot of the rest of it. Um, but we want to just check what communities you're involved with. So when we're developing our um, interventions that we choose, we can see what your preferences are. We'll just take a couple of moments um, to give you some time to complete um, the polls that are coming up based on um, the communities. Um, so first of all, looking at um, whether you're a member of one of the um, of one of our Dartmoor communities. Um, and then your association within that community as well. And then also we would like to um, to ask you what flood resilience means to you or what do you understand from the term flood resilience? We talk quite a lot about um, try aiming to increase flood resilience. So it's really important for us to understand what that means to people. So if you could just take a moment um, to put your thoughts down into that poll as well, please. Thank you. Once the once you've finished um, filling in your polls, we'll then be handing over to Tom Dorban from um, the Environment Agency, who's going to run through the Dartmoor Headwaters project for us. Um, so when you're ready, Tom, um, hopefully you should be able to enable your microphone. Well, we've enabled it, so hopefully you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? So over to you, Tom, when you're ready. Excellent. Thank you. Let me get rid of the poll on my screen. Uh, I can't. Ah, and you've got my slides. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Tom Dorban. As it says on the screen, I work for the Environment Agency and uh, I'm a senior advisor in our flood risk management team in Devon. Um, I'm also the lead of the Dartmoor Headwaters project, so the folks from West Country Rivers Trust have alluded to the project a couple of times, but I'm going to give you a little bit more of an overview and then they'll come on to talk about um, some work that's been done as part of it later on in a bit more detail. So the project uh, has been a fundamental change in how we do stuff for us. We've traditionally looked at building flood defences within communities, you know, working with community groups to set up um, flood groups and run training exercises and Liz, one of my colleagues, is going to talk a little bit about that later on. You know, we provide a flood warning service to communities as well. But this particular project has been very different in that we've started to look at not the causes and the impacts of flooding, but actually where has the flood come from in the first place, which when you say it like that sounds like common sense, but the traditional way to manage flooding so far has been very much about the impact and not necessarily the cause. Um, so uh, we'll go on uh, to the next slide, please, and have a quick look through um, why Dartmoor is important. So there's a couple of photos from some floods that we've had in the last few years there. The top one is 2012 in Buckfastly, and the bottom one, I think, was slightly later than that, maybe around 2017 in Peter Tavy on the west side of the moor. Um, 
as has already been said, you know, a lot of the catchments are very small, very fast responding. And typically in places like those, we can't provide the warnings quickly enough or we haven't been able to traditionally. Uh, and it's very difficult to get equipment and support there. But also, as was said, you know, it's challenging to get the traditional expensive engineered solutions to be to be justifiable economically. But if you look at the map that sits next to them, it's worth sort of reiterating that Dartmoor is a, a really important kind of hub at the spoke of a uh, sorry hub at the centre of a wheel with loads of watercourses radiating out, radiating out to the north and south coast like spokes from that hub. And there's about 20,000 properties, give or take a few hundred, that are at risk of flooding from water that originates on Dartmoor. So it's a really important landscape in terms of uh, both the risk to lots of property, but also obviously the recreational value, the agricultural traditions and so on that go on, and a lot of the archaeological interest in it. There are other risks it poses in that, that sort of uh, map of the river hydrology there. Uh, you know, the, the main road network and the rail lines are both at risk. Um, and when we talk about history of flooding, there's also a more immediate ring of risk around the outside of the moor, which is what that map on the left-hand side shows. Uh, I think Harriet was trying to convey some dates of flooding. So on the right, there's plenty of them. You know, we've got lots of, uh, lots of evidence of floods that have occurred. The difference between the black and the red is that where there's a red year, there's multiple events in a year. Obviously, the further back we go towards 1638, uh, you know, the, the logging of flooding is not as good, and we've had to do it on anecdotal evidence. But there's a real noticeable pattern of these small catchments having very intense storms, particularly during the summer months rather than the winter, that leads to problematic flooding. We can skip on to the next one, please. The ethos of the project is to tackle that, uh, that flood risk in those small catchments. But it's also not just about the flooding activity. There's also the biodiversity crisis and the ecology and the, the um, natural fabric of the river catchments, if you like. So on the left-hand side, we've got a map that shows the ecological status of all of those river catchments. And you can see, unfortunately, there's no green. Green is good. Uh, and then red uh, uh, is bad. And any uh, yellow or, or orange is in between is sort of moderate or poor status. A lot of it is due to uh, pollutants, to barriers to fish passage, to mine waste, and all sorts of problems that cause ecological issues. On the right-hand side, we've got maps that are looking at areas where we could provide nature recovery to enhance the biodiversity of the river catchments. And both of these aspects, you know, the, the water quality and the biodiversity are things that go hand in hand with the project and that we have looked at how we can optimise the solutions and you know, woodland creation, peatland restoration, land management practices are good for flood, ecology and biodiversity. And we're starting to learn how to piece those together collectively. We can skip on to the next one. So there's a lot of things that we've done. There's a lot of leaky structures that we've installed on the moor, as you can see there. There's bits of tree planting, there's various pieces of work on farmland. Uh, we've worked in a handful of catchments to date. Um, and we're looking at expanding to further locations in the future, but it's building on the learning from that phase. So what we're going to do next, the priority catchments that we've identified based on sort of the numbers of properties at risk and the hotspots of risk, which is what the sort of coloured splodges you can see on the map are, uh, are, are the focus for us. The orange catchments are the ones that we've worked on in the pilot and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do so. And the uh, purpley colour, I guess, is the ones that we're going to be adding to that as part of our next phase. The red stars are where we're looking at aligning with other projects like the upstream thinking activities that we've got mentioned earlier on, peatland restoration, other projects in our own capital programme and, and other local authority programmes as well. And I think there's only one more uh, slide after this. And then I think that's sort of my very quick overview of the project done. So I've not had a lot of time to talk to you about a hell of a lot of work that we've done. We've learned some really fascinating things from this project. There's loads of uh, really useful case studies that have influenced national work and other local projects. If you scan that QR code of your smartphone or if the slides get shared, the, the text, the black text on this slide will take you to a page on the Dartmoor National Park Authority website where there's newsletters, there's more information, there's a little film you can watch. I encourage you to go there. If you want to get in touch with us about the project and understand more about what we're up to, maybe how we're going to you know, work with the Rivers Trust and other organisations in the future, um, 
there are also links to get in touch on that page as well. And that's it as a quick overview of Dartmoor Headwaters. As I said, the, the Rivers Trust will talk to you about... Um, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much things. for that, Tom. Thank you. Um, so if we just move on now. So if we have a think about then, as Harriet mentioned earlier, um, the impacts of climate change are becoming an increasing problem. Um, so we're experiencing more cases of unpredictable weather and increased rainfall. And this is creating some, some big problems, both environmentally and socially, including downstream flooding, reduced water quality and smothered river habitats as well. Um, it's really important that we additionally think about how our rivers have changed over time and and actually a lot of our rivers have been straightened and narrowed and this can increase flow rates and sediment removal and um, can lead to downstream flooding as well. Um, so we talk quite a lot about increasing um, climate or flooding resilience, but it's really important to have a think about what resilience actually means. And resilience is our ability to bounce back from difficulties. So we can talk about climate resilience as the ability to withstand or to recover from climate change related difficulties. Um, so we then need to have a think about um, what are flood resilience measures? Um, so these are um, things that we can adopt or put in place um, that can enable us to better withstand and recover more quickly from those impacts of climate change. And, and included in that, obviously, is, is flooding, which is, is one of our, our main focuses. Um, so we are just going to have a look at some of the different ways um, that flood resilience could be increased. Um, so first of all, we've got integrated water management measures. Um, so this is looking at all aspects of water based infrastructure and it's, it's about optimising that infrastructure. Um, then we've got monitoring and management of local assets. So this is looking at, at sort of any any local asset, um, for example, bridges or dams, um, any natural flood management or sustainable drainage systems. Um, we're also looking at minimising damages and disruption um, to uh, small and medium businesses. Um, so it's looking to identify um, types of actions that could be used to minimise um, that damage. So, for example, looking at supply chains and operations, so trying to minimise the damage to them from flooding. We're then looking at increasing community infrastructure resilience. So again, it's looking at the resilience of um, public or community owned infrastructure. So local roads or community centres, libraries and, and sports halls So looking at the resilience of those to flooding. Um, we can then look at property flood resilience. So looking to engage communities to, um, to fit pro uh, property flood resilience measures such as floodgates. Um, we've then got um, community and voluntary sector action. Um, so this is looking at ways to involve communities in collaborative decision making about how we can manage um, flood risk um, in their areas and to help them to become better prepared and manage their own risk. Um, and potentially also looking at building um, community and voluntary um, capacity to help people recover from from flooding events. Um, also natural flood management, which is something that we're going to focus on um, in more detail later. And Rachel's going to take us through um, different types of flood management measures. Um, and then we're also looking at early flood warning systems. So again, looking at enhancing or localising flood warning systems. But Liz is get from the Environment Agency is going to be talking later on as well about the EA's flood warning systems. Um, so another poll that hopefully will be coming up um, in a moment is um, about flood resilience measures. So having a think about which of those um, flood resilience measures, I know it's only a very, very brief overview, but just from, from the information you've got at the moment, um, which of those do you think may work best within your community? Um, so just um, an indication. So uh, I think in the poll, you get to pick your top three, um, which you think would be, uh, would work best in your community. 
Um, so we'll just give you a couple of seconds there and then we'll continue. And then we'll, after we've done that, we'll say we'll leave that one up for just um, a couple of moments, just in case the pop up didn't work for anybody. Um, but then we are going to hand over to um, Charlotte Squire from um, Devon Communities Together. And Charlotte's going to take us through some um, community driven flood resilience measures um, that can be used. So thank you very much, Charlotte, for coming along this evening. Um, and I'm hoping that you should be able to unmute yourself and put your camera on. Fantastic. Hi. So when you're ready, Charlotte, over no to problem. you. Right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, yeah, my name's Charlotte Squire. I work for Devon Communities Together, which is a charity with lots of different projects on the go with a community focus. And um, this evening, we're going to be having a little look at the Devon Com Community Resilience Forum uh, and look at emergency plan, but with flooding as its as its focus. OK, to the next, please. OK, now what is community resilience? Um, now, don't change your answer from earlier because I know you've been asked this in the poll, but really community resilience, as Helen mentioned, is about that community bounce back. From a flooding perspective, it's making sure that local communities can react in an appropriate way and really protect the most vulnerable and lessen the impact on the community. It's about empowering communities as well, because there's a lot of local knowledge and skill there that you might not realise can be put to good use with, uh, with your flood plan. And it's about a resilient community that's working in partnership um, to, to complement the work of the emergency services and that can be before, during and after um, a flooding event. OK, next slide, if I could, please. So the Devon Community Resilience Forum is a group of people and organisations that come together for um, a range of different reasons. Now, Devon Communities Together can help develop their community emergency plan. And within that is your, your flood plan. It can help you apply for grants both to produce your plan and also to get some um, sort of PPE equipment, keep you up to date with news and events because there's quarterly newsletters and also um, biannual events. In fact, we've got an all day event um, going on tomorrow near Oakhampton. You can also help access uh, for training for resilience groups and be aware of urgent messaging um, about flooding and drought and transport. And it's a networking um, environment for people to learn what works and what doesn't. OK, next one, please. So the vision statement is to work with communities and individuals to develop and enhance their ability to harness local resources and expertise to help themselves plan for, respond to and recover from emergencies. OK, skip to the next, please. OK, so your flood plan. Um, DTT can help you to, to pull together your flood plan um, to recruit your flood warden, wardens and your community emergency responders. And you need to be able to understand your risk. Sign up to alerts, which we're going to hear all about shortly. Acquire equipment, so PPE equipment. There's some small amount of funding for that, as I mentioned. And identify vulnerable people and properties. So those people who may need extra help in a flooding event, um, maybe someone who has mobility issues, maybe somebody visually impaired. I'm sure you can think of many others as well. And it can help you to work with agencies. So know what the emergency services want um, you to have to help them do their job when they can arrive and uh, support you. And it can help you to identify community resources that can be available during a flood. So that might be a village hall or a church room that is not located in a floodplain that could be that place that um, supports people when they've had to evacuate from their homes. OK, skip to the next, please. Now, this picture always makes me laugh because I always think, where are their bodies? Um, so as I mentioned, you can get some um, grant funding for PPE. And so there are various different uh, different things that that you that you may need that you could get funding from through DCT. And next, please. And a local risk assessment is a really important part of the plan. Now, I know as soon as you say risk assessment, everybody puts their head in their hands and groans. And, and you know, I understand that it's, it's a painful term, but 
in a local flood plan, it's a really, really important part because you know the areas that are at risk. You know the areas that flood and and you have problems with. So you can you you can write down what the impact on the community is. Does it stop people getting to school? Does it stop people um, getting to their medical appointments, for example? And part of that risk assessment can be what can be done to try and reduce the likelihood of that flooding. So making sure that drains are clear, making sure that gutters are clear, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can think during a flood, what, you know, what needs to be done? It may be different in the summer, for example, if you have a lot of tourists who don't know the local area, how are you going to support them? So your local risk assessment is a very important part of your flood plan. Uh, next, please. Another important element is the local skills and resource assessment. So where are the medical professionals uh, within your community and how can you get hold of them? Who has a chainsaw? Who has trucks and lorries? You know, all these people that you really need um, to help you in your plan. You have um, the, the skills and you have the contact details. And next, please. So you pull together your um, emergency plan and your flood plan. You then just need to put it to the test, because as we all know, a paper exercise doesn't always work out in reality. Now, I think this particularly um, exercise discussion was run by the Environment Agency. And its aim was to um, see if uh, if the emergency plan basically works. So it puts a scenario forward and then you work through it with your plan. The feedback on this particular occasion was that at the end of the discussion, the scenario had highlighted some deficiencies in the plan and uh, we made some amendments to it. So that's exactly what these exercises are for. You can you know, organise them yourselves, but it helps your emergency responders to know the plan and it helps to understand what works and what doesn't. So you can go back and adapt as required. OK, next, please. Now, we all know that communities pull together. We've we've seen that during covid you know things were things were strange and and everybody you know sort of helped out to each other but you can make your response even more organized and effective by preparing an emergency community plan and interestingly emergency responders so the emergency services say that it helps them to know who to talk to in the community if uh, if they have put a plan together okay next please OK, um, I don't know that if we're asking for questions now, because I know time is quite limited, but can I just draw your attention, please, to the Devon Communities um, website link at the bottom? It's a really good resource for just finding out more information about emergency plans, um, but also about different templates and different support that, that you can get. If you did have any specific questions, um, my colleague Laura Dixon is the project manager for the Devon Community Resilience Forum, so her details are there. Thank you very much. That's perfect. Thank you ever so much, Charlotte. Um, yes, if you have got any questions for um, for Charlotte, I mean, feel free to pop them into the chat, um, but we have planned in some time um, at the end of the session, so hopefully we'll be able to go through um, go through questions then. If you have got questions for specific people, please feel free to, to say, who who you would like to to um, answer your question if it's from a particular um, topic area. Um, so just let us know. So thank you ever so much, Charlotte. Um, we're now going to um, hand over to Liz Taylor um, from the Environment Agency, who is going to be talking about flood warning systems. So again, hopefully, Liz, you should be able to um, unmute yourself and pop your camera on if you're happy to um, to take us through the the flood warning systems. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, really nice to see you this evening. So as mentioned, my name's Liz Taylor. I work in the flood resilience team at the Environment Agency and I cover all of Devon, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. Um, and I work with communities that are at risk of flooding from rivers in the sea to help them prepare for and respond to flooding. Um, so my team also develops and maintains the flood warning service that we use in some areas. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the flood warning service and a little bit about things that we can um, do to prepare for flooding. So if you want to move on to the next slide. Thank you. 
Um, so the Environment Agency has a statutory duty to warn and inform the public of their flood risk from main rivers and, and the sea. And in many places, we offer a free flood warning service. So people can register to receive flood warnings either as a phone call or a text message or an email. Um, some of the time phone numbers get automatically registered to this service, but um, you get a much better service if you fully register. And you can do this by going online on our, our website, checking whether you're at risk of flooding and then um, registering for the flood warning service. So on this slide, just highlighted what the three codes are that we use as part of our flood warning service. Um, so the first one at the bottom of the page is a flood alert. Um, and this is what we issue for quite large areas. Um, and they're usually issued in advance of a flood warning. Um, and these get issued when we're expecting flooding to low lying lands, perhaps roads and gardens, that sort of flooding expected. The next level of warning is a flood warning. Um, and these are issued when we do expect property flooding to occur. And finally, we've got a severe flood warning, um, and these are issued in conjunction with the emergency services and only really when there's a widespread danger to life. Um, but just because a severe flood warning isn't issued, it doesn't mean that there's not a potential risk to life because obviously all flood water is, is potentially dangerous. Um, so, this is just a quick slide to give you an idea of the sorts of numbers involved in the flood warnings that we've got across Devon and Cornwall. Um, so just really to highlight that in Devon, that as of December 2022, we have 20 flood alert areas and in um, we have 114 flood warning areas in Devon. So just to give you an idea of the sort of scale that we're talking about. Um, so on the next slide, just a bit about um, forecasts. Um, so you might have to click through a few times, sorry. So forecasts are a key factor when um, in the decision as to whether or not we issue a flood alert or a flood warning. And to produce a flood a forecast, um, there's quite a number of different experts involved in making those decisions. So first of all, the Environment Agency and the Met Office work together um, at the Flood Forecasting Centre, which we've got based in Exeter, and they produce the most complete national picture of flood risk that they can, and they take into account developing weather and then through to the actual flood event itself. And this information gets passed down to our regional modelling and forecasting duty officers. And they kind of translate that into what the local flood risk is. And then that in turn gets passed on to our flood warning duty officers. And they use these forecasts alongside real time telemetry. And they use that to issue the flood warnings that I just mentioned out to the communities that are likely to be at risk of flooding. So our team then monitors um, warnings, updates them if the situation changes. Um, and update these updates go out through those various channels through email, through text or through also through our social media. And we have teams of duty officers who are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week monitoring that information. Um, the next slide is a bit of a complicated one. Again, it might take a bit of clicking through, but I'll just give you a, a quick overview of sort of what happens when we issue a flood warning. So for each fluvial flood warning, so warnings that are associated with a river, they're linked to a, a measuring gauge and there's a trigger level. And when the water levels at that gauge reach that trigger level, then the flood warning duty officer will consider whether or not to issue a flood warning. Um, so the key, key here is um, whether or not the levels are likely to continue rising. Um, past the level at which property flooding is to, to be expected. So <clears throat> just on this graph here, you've got the codes down the left hand side and the one in grey at Val is a, a flood alert. So at that level, at that threshold, we would issue a flood alert as the um, level goes through that trigger. The next level in green is an ACTCON flood warning. So this is where we would consider issuing a flood warning. And that point between the green dotted line and the red dotted line is a bit of a decision 
line or decision area. So the red dotted line is where we would expect property flooding to happen. It's a resultant flood warning threshold. Um, and if you click through a little bit more, there's just some examples of the sorts of things that could happen um, in different situations. So it might be that we issue a flood alert, um, which would usually be done in sociable hours, so pre preferably daylight hours. Um, so that would go out if the flood alert trigger was met. Um, when the green thresholds met, the flood warning duty officer will think about whether what the forecast is, think about the certainty of the forecast and the potential impacts. And as you can see, there's you know situations where the water level may continue to rise, but drop off before property level flooding is has happened. But we may have issued a warning already, or it may go through that that property flooding threshold. Um, but obviously, on Dartmoor, a lot of our catchments react very quickly, so that decision zone might be as little as half an hour to an hour. So decisions sometimes have to be made very quickly, and that can lead to to water levels rising, it, warnings going out, but actually property level not, not resulting. Um, so we want to click through to the next slide. Um, so as well as the site information that's available to our duty officers, all our gauges, I think all our gauges, most of our gauges are visible on our Check for Flooding website. So I've popped the web address on there so you can go on have a look at the the gauges that are in your local area um, there's an interactive map which is the bit shown on the left and then you can have a look at the the graph which we've given an example on the right which is updated every 15 minutes um, and that you can look at a five day period and also look at what the highest level on record is so that information is available to the public um, on the next slide, it just popped a bit in there about rapid res rapid response catchments, which obviously spoken a bit about previously. So as mentioned, Devon and Cornwall, there are 76 communities that are classified by the Environment Agency as rapid response catchments. Um, these have been identified based on topography and land use and vulnerability of the community, um, maybe because there are a lot of tourists in that area. And across Dartmoor, We've got Buckfastley, Ashburton, Oakhampton and Horrorbridge, who are all classed as rapid response catchments. And in these locations, that flash flooding is likely to happen with very limited warning. Um, and it may well be unlikely that we can get a warning out. Um, so on this next slide, it's just as an important tool for preparing for that sort of flash flood risk, we really encourage people to sign up for the Met Office Severe Weather Warning Service. Um, and you can do that on their website and get um, that early heads up about things like potential thunderstorms in your local area. Um, so on the final slide, it's just um, a bit of information that we share with the public in terms of things that can be done to prepare for a flood. So you might consider having things like a personal flood plan or a grab bag of important items. Um, Obviously, if you saw the, the footage of the flooding last week in East Devon, you'll have seen how quickly that sort of flooding can happen. So we really encourage people to spend a bit of time in advance thinking about what you would do if you were in a flood. So would you be able to go upstairs or do you live in a bungalow? Um, think about keeping your valuable items safe upstairs. Do you know how to turn off your gas, electricity and water? Um, if you were to be evacuated, would you know what you would need to take with you? Um, and we've got information leaflets like the one include, uh, shown here, which we hand out to people and encourage them to take some of those actions. Um, and that was it from me. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much for that, Liz. Um, and again, with questions, um, if um, if you do have any specific questions, then please feel free to pop them into the chat or um, we can come back to them at the end of the session. Um, so we're now going to um, move on to watch um, a short video called High Water Common Ground. 
which focuses on the use of natural flood management and also really highlights the importance of working together um, to increase flooding resilience. Um, and following this, um, Rachel will talk through um, some of the key natural flood management techniques that can be used. So just to give you a bit more information on what natural flood management can look like. Hey, hello again, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to run through a quick introduction of what um, NFM actually is. Um, so natural flood management is a collection of techniques that are used to restore and to mimic the natural functioning um, of catchments and rivers. This typically involves slowing down the flow of water and storing water to reduce flood risk in downstream communities. You might hear natural flood management referred to as um, working with natural processes, slowing the flow measures or upstream management. Um, but NFM sits under the umbrella term of nature based solutions, um, which is the use of natural features and processes to tackle socioeconomic environmental issues. Fantastic. So what actually is um, slowing the flow? So as Helen previously mentioned, uh, we straightened many of our rivers, um, which increases the speed of water throughout our catchments. Um, however, our land can also contribute um, to this. So imagining that our soils are a sponge, we use a metaphor, our, our, our soils is like a sponge. Um, so due to a lot of land management practices and urbanisation, we metaphorically dipped the top layer of the sponge into concrete. This means that the water runs straight off the top um, and cannot be absorbed down into the soil or into the sponge. By introducing NFM measures, we're able to hold back this water, really reducing that concrete layer and allowing more time for water to absorb into the sponge. So in terms of the metaphor, a healthy sponge represents healthy soils. So I have reused or I've stolen these slides from Liz's presentation because I thought it was, it was very useful. Um, and what we've done is we have added on um, a line, just skip on the next yeah. slide, um, to represent what happens in the catchment when we implement NFM, basically meaning that we can take the top off this flood peak. So we can't reduce the amount of water within a catchment. But with natural flood management, we're able to hold that water upstream for much longer, meaning there's more time between a flood warning being issued and the actual flood peak. A couple of the categories of NFM techniques that can be used for flood resilience. This isn't an exhaustive list. There are many more NFM measures um, that can be implemented. But I could talk forever. <laughs> But firstly, we have soil and land management. So agricultural land management aims to reduce compaction, um, improving the soil structure and increasing soil permeability in order to increase the capacity of land to store water. This is beneficial as healthy soils capture more water and allow water to move through the structure into those groundwater stores. So a couple of different soil and land management techniques. Um, can include soil aeration and decompaction, which is reducing the compaction of the soil. Um, another is stock fencing, so that can be restricting where stock can roam, um, particularly close to water watercourses. Um, this reduces um, the impact of poaching, um, so where soil has been broken and compacted under the weight of either machinery or um, livestock. Um, we can plant cover or catch crops, um, particularly during winter, um, and this protects the stability of the soils. Uh, and they can also implement some forms of runoff management. Um, so this involves the interruption and or the diversion of overland flow pathways. Um, so that's just the water that is running off the surface of the land. Um, and we can divert in a way from flat flow surfaces, um, such as concrete tracks um, that we talked about a little with our sponge analogy. So to focus in on decompaction, to focus in on this technique, um, it's one of the most effective techniques for reducing this overland flow, um, mainly because it improves the connectivity with our groundwater stores um, and promotes that groundwater recharge through, inf through infiltration through those soils. Um, this reduces the volume of water entering watercourses um, and increases the quantity of water that's able to be stored in the soil. 
So there are a number of co-benefits um, of the compaction. So co-benefits are just the extra benefits on top of that um, flood resilience that can be generated by lots of these unauthentic natural flood management techniques. Um, so in terms of decompaction, it can en enhance productivity and it also reduces the pollution that's entering the watercourses. Moving on to our next type of technique, which is woodland planting. Um, woodland can be planted across catchments and although in different locations, the same flood management benefits can be achieved. Um, planting trees is a great way to slow down the flow of water both on land and in river stream channels. Trees intercept rainfall, they increase evaporation and the uptake of water by vegetation and improve infiltration through the soil structure. There are four different um, areas in which we can plant trees. The first being um, cross slope planting. Um, this involves planting trees in woodland belts across steep slopes to slow down the flow down those slopes. The second is riparian planting. So this is planting trees in the river corridor um, to slow the flow of water in river channels. Next, we move on to floodplain woodland planting. Um, this involves planting trees in the floodplain to slow the flow across that floodplain. And the final one is catchment woodland. Uh, and this is just increasing the woodland cover across the, across the entire kind of catchment landscape. So if we focus specifically on uh, riparian planting, so planting a range of woodland species in riparian zones um, slows the flow of water in these channels, but they can also reduce the amount of sediment uh, and bankside erosion, um, improving the stability um, of the riverbanks. Tree planting also provides lots of co-benefits, um, similarly to our soils and um, soil improvements, um, they can reduce the pollution entering watercourses, um, but they can also provide habitats for aquatic species and invertebrates. They can increase biodiversity and improve the visual appeal of the area. We're moving on to floodplain reconnection. Um, historically, our floodplains have been drained for agriculture and development, uh, and currently around 90% of our remaining floodplains are not functioning correctly. Um, our NS NFM interventions look to restore and or enhance our existing floodplains or create new floodplains to maximise their water storage capabilities, allowing them to return to their natural functioning. So we can reconnect our floodplains um, through things known as paleo channels, which are remnants of previously or currently inactive streams or channels that have been filled with sediment. So we can remove that sediment and reconnect those floodplains. And we can also lower, remove or set back embankments um, or add in new internal features to divert water um, across onto the floodplains. So co-benefits of floodplains, so we have drought resilience, um, they can provide habitats for species um, and they can also hold an awful lot of carbon, capture a lot of carbon and store a lot of carbon. So moving on to water storage, which is the fourth category um, of NFM techniques. Um, so these look to store water in the catchment and slow the rate at which water runs off the landscape into our rivers. So rather than restoring a function, these techniques are emulating the natural functioning of our rivers, um, particularly in vulnerable locations such as where flooding occurs in downstream communities. So often these techniques are used in unison with other NFM measures, um, so techniques such as leaky barriers, we can reconnect floodplains by holding back the water using a leaky barrier, which can then spill out onto nearby land, creating or reconnecting a floodplain. A couple of different techniques used for water storage. So we have leaky barriers. So these are internal or on land techniques that hold back or slow the flow of water. We have sediment traps, so these trap sediment, preventing it from ending up in our watercourses, um, which can reduce their capacity, um, but they also capture pollution, so they also have additional benefits as well. So we have soakaways next, um, so these are drainage techniques for surface water runoff. Um, so basically they are holes dug into the ground that collect water and allow it to permeate into the ground when the soil has the capacity to do so. So it just holds on to that water uh, and allows it to slow, slowly soak um, into our soils. The next one is runoff storage. 
and um, these are similar to ponds but the, the water comes from slightly different sources so overland runoff um, can be intercepted and diverted and collected for short periods of time either eventually evaporating or infiltrating through into the ground so if we focus on leaky barriers or the water storage technique um, as i said before these can be used on land um, and in water so in water they act as an obstacle to slow down um, the flow of water or to under store water um, in small streams um, and their immediate, immediate connected floodplain. Um, on land, on the other hand, um, they act as a barrier across overland flow pathways, so that surface water again running off the land, um, and they slow the flow of water entering a watercourse. Um, so these typically include introduction of woody debris um, or the introduction of stone attenuators, which are also known as leaky walls. Um, we'll have a, a closer look um, at stone attenuators um, in the following slides in our Watkhampton case study that we're coming to you very shortly. So we've just got an overview um, of all the NFM techniques that I've mentioned today um, in this presentation for you just to have a look at. We've got a couple more polls coming up. Um, over the next couple of slides. Um, so we'll just leave the slide up there just so you can um, kind of take it all in and just remind yourself um, what I've talked about while we, while we launch these polls. Um, so the first poll that you should have had is one asking about which of those um, NFM options um, you, would, you would be happy to see um, within your community. Um, and then the second poll is asking um, which co-benefits you, you would most like NFM to achieve. Um, so if you have a particular interest, for example, in water quality or in increasing biodiversity. So just thinking about although we're we're looking at um, natural flood management from a from a flooding resilience um, viewpoint. Like Rachel said, a lot of these techniques will have co-benefits or multiple environmental benefits. So looking at those is really important as well. So we've uh, it's really evenly distributed. So we've either had somebody select them all. Um, yeah, if you can try to select just three on those ones, that's great. I don't know if you, if you've selected more than three, I don't know if you'll be able to edit it. Um, but yeah, it's either multiple people have submitted mm. and put in different things or um, somebody's gone to tick them all. <laughs> um, oh no, we've had three responses in total on that first one. So we'll give a little bit more time mm. to be able to select those. Um, well, if we go back to the last slide, so if we've got somebody whose poll's not working, they can choose three off there instead um, and put it in the chat if they like. Um, Whereas the co-benefits is getting, oh, that's got some clearer hmm. um, needs um, of habitat provision, increased biodiversity and carbon capture. Yeah. Let's see if we can get forth. Yeah, if we just leave that one, leave that slide up for a moment, just to give people an overview. There's quite a lot of information to cover in natural flood management. OK, so we'll leave um, we'll leave those polls open so you can um, you can have a think about those and feel free to go back into them um, and add in any thoughts that you've got. Um, we're now going to move on to have a look at um, some natural flood management that has already been um, put in place um, in Walkhampton. So if we move on to that one. Fantastic. Um, so. Uh, West Country Rivers Trust has um, delivered some natural flood management um, through the Dartmoor Headwaters project that Tom um, introduced at the beginning of this evening's presentation. And um, like, like he said earlier, it's a partnership between um, the Dartmoor National Park Authority and the Environment Agency. Um, so some leaky stone dams were installed using local granite um, in corn ditches to slow the flow of water off the moor. Um, they were installed by um, our operations team um, here at West Country Rivers Trust. Um, our operations team have got a, a, a made up of, of people who come from a range of different academic backgrounds and experiences and qualifications and skill sets, and they support and complement um, one another. Um, on an assortment of catchment space work, um, including the implementation of natural flood management. 
Um, so the leaky stone dams um, were constructed to allow the low flows of water to pass through. Um, but during higher flows, um, water was held back. And it's really important that the low flows were allowed um, to, to move through, um, because if they were to stop those low flows, then during high flow or high rainfall events, water could overtop those um, the, the leaky stone dams. And again, linking back to what Rachel and Liz said um, in terms of the volume of water in the catchment, that can't that can't be reduced. However, what we can try to do is through natural flood management, such as um, these leaky stone dams or stone attenuators that have been put in at Walkhampton, is that we can try and reduce that um, that peak on the flood graph. And that can mean the difference between um, us having those um, higher flood alerts um, and and that that intense flooding um, downstream. So that's what they're they're looking um, they're looking they're aiming um, to do. But that obviously that's um, that's just one example um, from the Headwaters project at Walkhampton. So um, we're now coming to the end of our evening. So we hope that it's been really useful for you. 